you went to a car show. Yep. And you were at, that happened to be the right place yep. at the right time, and you met the right guy. Four day old cleaning company, and within one year, uh, do you remember what the revenue was that first year? Or does, do you, is that uh, revenue year one? Two hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Right, so your trip to the car show was a quarter of a million dollar. Yeah, quarter million dollar trip. In today's ultra competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. All right, welcome to The Root of All Success. I'm the real Jason Duncan, and if you are watching this on YouTube, you just saw a big waft of smoke go right across the screen. If you're not watching this on YouTube and you're listening to on any of the podcast players, Stitcher, uh, Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening to, first of all, thank you. Appreciate you listening. But if you're not watching this on YouTube, you're missing out. Like I filmed this downtown in Nashville, Tennessee, at the Matador Room at the Standard of the Smith House. And I know that you don't see a ton of the room when you're watching this on YouTube, but you do get to see my guest. You get to see me. Sorry about that. But you also get to see what we're smoking. Sometimes I smoke cigars with my guests, like I'm uh, smoking today with my guest. And there's a reason for that, because he happens to be in the cigar business. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in our story. But I'm coming to you, like I said, we record these live in the Matador Room here at the Standard at the Smith House. I'm honored to be a member here. It's one of the top five cigar bars in the country, one of the top steakhouses in the country. And if you ever come to Nashville, you can go to the, the private restaurant club, or actually it's a public restaurant downstairs, private club upstairs. And uh, if you come and you go eat downstairs and you are very nice to the wait staff and say, hey, I heard Jason Duncan talk on the Root of All Success that there's a private club upstairs. Can I take a tour? And they will give you a little tour. Just tell them you heard about that right here on the Root of All Success. This, uh, the standard is propri the proprietor of the standard is the one and only Joshua Sterling Smith. This is 18,000 square feet of Southern sophistication and style right here in the heart of downtown Nashville. And it is a must do when you visit the city. You've got to come here and check this out. Our episode sponsor for today is One Nine. And I know you've got a website. If you don't have a website, what in the world are you doing? Like, you got to have a website. But your website guy or your girl who designed that website may be MIA or they've uh, they've upped their prices and it's too cost prohibitive for you to work with them or you designed the website 10 years ago and you haven't had anybody update it one nine eliminates all those issues for you what they do for a small flat monthly fee they manage your site host your site, keep your site secure, they update it, they make sure that it's mobile ready, mobile friendly, everything you need, they just take your current site and they take it all. Like it, they do my personal site at therealjasonduncan.com and since they took it over, I can tell you there has been an uptick in traffic, there's been an uptick in the way that people interact with it, with calls to action where they're, they're just going to make it sure that it works right. And as a listener to The Root of All Success, you get $600 off your annual subscription for that. And it's really not that expensive. So here's how you get in touch with One9. Go to Manage My Websites, that's plural, managemywebsites.com slash root, as in root of all success. And when you go to that site, fill in your information, it will automatically qualify for $600 off the annual subscription for that service. And I cannot recommend it more highly. As a matter of fact, the CEO, Nathan Ruff, was also a guest here on my podcast not too long ago. And they run a fantastic company. He does a great job with websites. And so no matter who did your website originally, like my guy who did mine originally is great, still work with him on all my other stuff. But Nathan and, and One Nine, they took it over and they do a fantastic job. So go check them out, managemywebsites.com slash root. Now, on with the show. So my guest today is a, um, we were talking pre-show, neither of us know where the hell we met each other. <laughs> we don't know how we met, 
but we have become friends on Instagram. He lives in San Diego, California, and he's flown all the way over here to Nashville just to be a guest on my podcast. And we got a little something else special for tomorrow night. We got this big dinner we're doing. It's also kind of cool. But but he uh, we met somehow. Uh, who knows? And then we he invited me on his podcast. He also hosts of a podcast called There Is No Try. And he invited me on his podcast sometime, I think it was June of 2020. And then we connected on Instagram and other places and just stayed in touch. And he posts amazing content. And you can follow him at Puro Traders. That's P-U-R-O-T-R-A-D-E-R-S. Did I say that right? So Puro Traders on Instagram. And you can follow him there. And got great content, really encouraging. Of course, if you like cigars, there's a ton there. And then you can follow his personal page, which we'll give more contact information at the end of the show. But but here's the deal. This guy, just like a lot of us entrepreneurs, at nine years old, started a lawnmower business because he wanted to, he was independent, had this independent streak in nature, and he wanted to go out there and make money, just like you did, just like I did, started a lawnmower business as a young kid. And then that eventually turned into uh, him going to work in the corporate world, answering phones for a large major Fortune 500 company, where at the age of 26, he became the youngest senior vice president ever in the history of the company and spent a lot of time working for those Fortune 500 companies and was also this cigar nerd who loved cigars. And he was looking for um, looking for a certain rare cigar online one day. and. Um, he was trying to figure out where, where to find the cigar, couldn't find it. And he said to himself, I bet there's a way that if I could put together a database of all these different independent cigar collections that people have all over the world, there'd be this great way to, to bring cigar lovers together and share our inventories. And there, that is how his company, Puro Traders, was born. And now it's a multi-million dollar SaaS company that is the largest peer-to-peer uh, network on cigars in the world. And if you're into cigars, you need to go follow them, go look at what they do. It's a fantastic business. And he's got other businesses too. He's got a venture capital firm that he, he has and he's gonna talk more about today. He's got a wine business he started. This guy's awesome and I have no idea how I met him, but let's please welcome the great Pierre Rogers. Thank you for being here, man. Thank you so much for having me. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Well, you just got off a flight, so I did. I mean, <laughs> so the flying from uh, California to Nashville in these these days is uh, is not as easy as it used to be. With all the still, we're still dealing a little bit with the pandemic, but uh, but we're glad. I'm glad. I'm very glad that you're here, and uh, I'm honored that I got on your podcast again. I don't know how in the world we met, but glad that it all happened. I think that within a certain group of people that are really trying to put positive energy out there, help other people, high quality people, high caliber people. If you just keep working and doing your craft, you attract those other people, sort of the universal law of, uh, of attraction. It just happens, or, or you're attracted to them, one, one way or the other, but it just sort of happens that way. I have so many friends that I couldn't even tell you how we are friends or how we even met that feels like we've been lifelong friends that have, are in wildly different industries from completely different states. Yep. And yet I talk to them all the time and, and we've been friends and I don't even know how that happened, right? It's wild. And I, th- I tell you too, I know that um, there's lots of strong opinions on all the different social media platforms. <laughs> well, that's not what I meant. There are strong opinions demonstrated on those platforms. That's not what I meant. But there are strong opinions about the platforms. And I'm going to tell you, I joined, joined, got on, li- uh, not LinkedIn, I've been on LinkedIn a long time, Instagram. Instagram along, I guess it was about 2018, 2019, somewhere around there. Didn't know what I was doing. I had a marketing uh, lady who worked for me and she was like, you need to get on Instagram. So I got on Instagram. And I'm telling you, Pierre, I have met some of the coolest people yeah. like you on Instagram. And no, no, no lie. Like I'm going to be on a lady's podcast sometime this year. I don't know. Like, I don't know when this is going to air, but like sometime this year, and she's in Australia and or actually lives in Tasmania, which I think is part of Australia. I need to learn my geography before I go on the show. But but she she and I connected on Instagram somehow. I really liked what she was doing, and like, and she started following me. She liked what I was doing, and she's like, "Hey, you want to be on my show?" I'm like, yeah. And by the way, you want to be on my show? Now, here's the deal: she can't fly to Nashville, um, and I'm I would love to go to Australia, but I'm not going to do it right now. So we're going to do it by Zoom. So I don't do many shows by Zoom. I know you do your shows by Zoom, at least Some, you do with me. Yeah. But uh, but I, but there's a 14 hour time difference, so I got to figure out how to make that happen. <laughs> so I think I'm recording at like 7:30 at night or something. But Instagram has been this phenomenal place. So my Instagram handle is the real Jason Duncan. What is yours? Mine is Puro P U R O Rogers. 
All right, so like Puro Traders, yes. but Puro Rogers, Puro, yes. P-U-R-O Rogers, just like the name of the nest on. So you go go follow him. I know we're going to talk more about how to get in touch with uh, with Pierre at the end of the show, but I, I just want to give a shout out to Instagram. You know, the, the, <laughs> the fact that you're sitting across the table here at the Standard is because we're friends on Instagram. We follow each other, and I guess that's not really the term friends on Instagram. But anyhow, we really are friends on Instagram, and uh, I'm just glad you're here. So no, let's let's talk about this before we get into business. You have a really nice car. I do. One that I like because I'm a Porsche guy okay. as well. I'm not fortunate enough to own a, a, a real good classic like you do, but we've never talked about this. Nope. But I've seen pictures on Instagram and okay. videos, <laughs> and so I'm going to indulge myself whether the listeners care about it or not, but I kind of think that there's somebody out there that will. What is What year is your Porsche? Tell us a little bit about that 911. Okay. Before we hop into car talk, because I love cars, love cars, cars are my passion, on my Instagram page... I really try hard to not show off, right? I try not I to can, get fly. I can testify to that. That is not, the, I'm not asking you to talk about your Porsche because you're a baller and you're trying to right. show your Porsche. No, I genuinely like classic cars and I know that's how you present it. Yeah, I, and I love classic cars. I love all kinds of cars, but I, I, I it's a funny thing because if, you, if you're on social media and you want to grow your following, a really easy way to do that is to show off, which is what a lot of people do. Right. And um, the, the, so you fall into a sort of a trap of, of showing off. And I really try hard to not show my cars uh, and not show watches and vacations and really just try to focus on positive content that can help people uh, move forward. That's it. There's nothing for sale. There's nothing. There's, that's just what I like doing. I, I just enjoy doing that. And, and my favorite part, my payment for all that is people slide into my DMs and they're like, man, thank you so much. I've been going through this. Uh, I'm trying to get promoted. I'm, I, I think I have to move for my job. What do I do about my girl? And I try to do the best thing that I can do and give them advice. And that for me is, is, is all I ask for. But I do love cars. <laughs> so every once in a while... I'll post a picture of my car, um, my Porsche. So it is a uh, it's a, a very interesting Porsche. It is actually a 1976, but it's been backdated with all original, what we call new old stock NOS parts, to look like a 1969 911S, which, in my opinion, is the most beautiful looking. It's the first Porsche, right? The very first body style. Uh, so we use a, a newer chassis using old panels to make it look old. And then I might have a 3.2 liter board and stroke Porsche engine in the back. So that car originally came with a 2.2 liter or two liter, depending on which model you had of the, or of the long hoods. Um, and not a lot of horsepower. They're about 110 horsepower back then, 120 horsepower. Mine's a bit more than that. Uh, mine's a little closer, about 300 horsepower. Whoa. So, and a, a 300 doesn't sound like a lot, but on a little car like that that weighs next to nothing, I'm telling you, man, it move, It really scoots. And I've pulled up next to Corvettes and other cars that they look at my old Porsche and they think it's going to be a clunker and smoke them. Um, but, but the reason I like that car is it's the most pure driving experience I've ever had. So my car before that was a, was a Rolls-Royce Ghost. Uh, the car before that was a Ferrari F430, right? Very different in driving uh, experiences. But the thing I noticed about the Porsche, it is the purest form of visceral driving, right? It's so an deeply analog, right? Everything that we do now is all digital, including your car, right? This is the exact opposite of that, right? It's manual brakes, it's manual steering, there's no air conditioning. Uh, the defroster air conditioning is rolling down the window, Yep. right? That is it. Um, you feel every bump in the road, the vibration, the sounds. You can't listen to the radio. You, there's a radio in it. There's no reason for it. You can't hear it, right? You can't take a phone call. Uh, you can't text while you're driving because it's so involved between shifting and just handling this thing. And that's the best part. You have this sort of clarity of thought because now everything else in your world has gone away. You have to focus on keeping this thing on the ground. And man, it is the best. I, I absolutely love it. And I did, what I didn't know about the car is how much other people were going to enjoy it. This is the first car, and I've, I've owned a lot of fun exotic cars, but this is the first exotic car or 
unique car I've ever owned that universally everybody thumbs up, pictures, they want to talk about it. I'm talking uh, police officers, old people, young girls who usually don't care too heck of a lot about cars. Um, everybody universally is like, man, that's cool. I like it. Can I take a picture with it? Can I sit in it? And I'm like, absolutely, right? Come, come on through. So it, it's really unique. I will say that was not my experience with the Rolls Royce. Uh, a little bit different. <laughs> a little, a little, a little, bit little different. car envy on the, on the Rolls Royce. Yeah, not quite the same. Uh-huh. But uh, no, it's my, it's my favorite car I've ever owned. Well, really I know beautiful. that I've never seen a picture of the entire car on your, not that you haven't posted it, but I, but what I saw was you posted a picture of you driving one day and you were talking, but it was a shot out over the hood. And I knew what it was, even though you weren't saying, Hey, I'm in my Porsche. I knew what it was. Cause I like old Porsches. And, uh, anyway, I, I know that was kind of a sidebar and most people may not care about it, but thank you for indulging me. And, uh, when I come to your neck of the woods, I want to ride Let and I would go. love to drive it, but I don't want to be so presumptuous, but I will take a ride. I will sit in the passenger seat and I will grin from ear to ear as we ride through the, the hills and, uh, around the, around where you live. But thank you for, thank you for the indulgence. Now, so let's go, let's go into business. So you, you, you've got wine, you got cigars, you've got, uh, your venture capital, yep. Let's start with the cigars. So with the cigar business, Puro Trader, that that really was your entryway into entrepreneurialism. Is that right? Other than your lawn mowing business as a kid. But was that the beginning of your entrepreneurship or was there something else that wasn't part of the intro? Yeah, so I have started many businesses. Some little side hustles, you might call them, to some that were much larger uh, and much more successful. Um, I should probably tell the story about how I started a cleaning company accidentally. Okay. So it is uh, 2000 and I think 2010, 2011. And I had, uh, I worked at, uh, for Bank of America and I was a senior vice president and uh, I was fortunate enough to be making a pretty strong income. And my accountant said to me, man, you got to start a business. You you're getting crushed on taxes because I'm a W-2 employee getting commission, which means for people listening at home, you're in California, you're paying 55% in taxes, right? Uh, a lot, right? You know, half basically is gone. So he said, man, you got to do something. And I'll never forget it. He goes, I don't care if you sell baseball cards on eBay, you got to do something. I said, okay. And I kid you not, Jason, I went home and I Googled what's the easiest business to start. Clean it commercial cleaning, no overhead. You don't need an office. You need a broom. That's it. Right? So I said, okay. So I went, I got my EIN number. I started the corporation. I went and had a website built and that is it. That's my whole business, an EIN number and a website, nothing. There's no advertising behind it. There is no nothing. I had just started it. So I probably owned that cleaning company for no kidding, four or five days. And I go to a car show on a Sunday morning, like local car show, kind of cars and coffee thing, right? It's really four car guys about cars, right? It's not really sort of open to the public. So it's early on a Sunday morning, probably about 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And I pull in and I'm driving a red F430 Ferrari. And there's a yellow F430 Ferrari. I park right next to them. And there's probably about 150 cars that had shown up, but we were the only two Ferrari F430s. We were the only only of that model. And so as, as it would happen, the owner comes over to me and says, Hey, I got the yellow one. You got the red one. I said, yeah, we, so we start talking and we've been talking for probably about a half an hour, hour, sipping our coffee, walking around, look at the other cars, just talking about life. And he goes, man, what do you do? And I decided I'd be a, uh, you know, kind of crack wise a little bit. And I go, Oh, I'm a janitor. It's funny, right? I got out of a Ferrari. I'm a janitor. He goes, oh, that's interesting. I'm the largest property manager in all of Sacramento. We should talk. Five days later, he calls me and says, can you start? We're firing our cleaning company. Uh, I need you to come through. I manage a 180,000 square foot medical office. I need it cleaned five days a week. Jason, I don't have a broom. I don't have anything. I have nothing. Okay. <laughs> so I go, yeah, absolutely. We'll do that. Of course. I don't know how to price this. I've never bid on a job. I don't know anything. So now I'm trying to figure out, okay, 
What's the cleaning business? Well, it's labor arbitrage, right? How much can I get labor for versus how much I can charge for the labor? I make the difference, okay? Plus there's some materials involved. All right, let's go. And I kid you not, for a month, so we hired a whole bunch of people real what, quick. What year was this, by the way? 2000 and, gosh, it's gotta be 2015-ish, 2014. Okay, so not long. Not long. long ago. No. Um, so we hired a bunch of people, and I would work my day job at night, suit and tie, the whole nine. And then I'd go home, have dinner with my family, and I'd leave dinner, and I would drive over to this medical building, and my crew would meet me there. I still have the suit and tie on. I have not taken that off. And we would clean the building from 9 p.m. until about 3.34 4, a.m. Then I'd go home, and I'd sleep for about two, three hours, and I did that again. I did that for a month. Not sustainable much longer than that. Until we got the crew trained up and we f frankly just figured it out. I mean, I, I'm making it sound sort of glamorous. We stumbled and bumbled and made every stupid mistake and the client was mad at us and we're just figuring it out, man. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, but we were fortunate enough to hire some good people. And so we got that building and it paid us a nice income. And well, once you get that one, you get another one and another one begets another. And within 12 months, we had 35 employees and we're cleaning for uh, the, the state, we're, we're cleaning for the, you know, the DMV, we're cleaning for all these different big medical buildings. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely wild. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> this plays into, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump the gun a little bit. I usually go much deeper into stories before I get into my keys of success that we talk about. But what you just revealed is so dead on and two of those keys, right place, right time and knowing the right people for success that I gotta, I gotta do this. So like my five keys of success start with passion. And then the second one is place, being in the right place, right time. Third one is knowing the right people. Fourth is preparation. The fifth is plan, which we'll get into all those. But you went to a car show. Yep. And you were, at, that happened to be the right place yep. at the right time. And you met the right guy. Four day old cleaning company. And within one year, uh, do you remember what the revenue was that first year? Or does, do you, is that? Uh, revenue year one. Two hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Right, so your trip to the car show was a quarter of a million dollar. Yeah, quarter of a million dollar trip. People listen to that, guys. I, I, I tell you, and I'm going to look at the camera. I don't normally look at the camera during the middle of the show, but for those of you watching this on YouTube and listening, listen, listen. This is what entrepreneurialism is about. You might say, "Ah, oh, Pierre was really lucky, lucky to be right there at that car show." No, let me tell you something. You're not lucky driving a Ferrari. Like you worked hard to get the Ferrari. He worked hard and he got that. Sure. You own that uh, on that as a result of your corporate gig, mm -hmm. but you parlayed that into this huge opportunity that then turned into another one. So what happened to that cleaning company? What happened later? Did you sell it? We, we ended up selling it. Yeah. So we called up a local competitor and it's kind of a funny story. So I'll give the, the, a little more detail here. So I'm on vacation with my wife and, and kids and with any business, you have things, things that break problems, right? So I don't care how big your business is and how perfect it is, stuff goes sideways. And um, payroll checks went out and something had happened to our account where it had gotten frozen, which mean, we didn't know why. We didn't, it had nothing to do with us. Something happened with the bank. Did Bank of America mess you over? <laughs> trying not to say, trying not to say that. So my wife and I are on a beach in Hawaii with our two kids and we spent, I kid you not, the whole day, six hours, both of us on the phone with Bank of America trying to figure out how to get my employees paid that day. Plenty of money in the account. These, these are folks that they need many it. of them, they need it, right? Yeah. This is, they got paid on a Friday, they got paid on a Friday. They're not waiting until Monday when the bank gets it all figured out, right? And my wife and I, it really ruined our vacation to, to some degree, right? Um, and my wife looks at me and goes, why are we doing this? We don't need the money. Y you started this stupid thing by accident and it, y y now, you're, now it's super successful and it's killing our vacation. And by the way, I had looped her in uh, into it because the work was just all consuming. So she was doing a bunch of HR stuff and payroll processing and doing all that stuff for us. Just because it was growing so quickly 
we just didn't have the time to, to hire someone properly to do that. Um, which is true for almost every entrepreneur I've ever heard of, right? There's, there's those moments. And we just decided at that time, you know what, this isn't, my life's passion was not janitorial services. Uh, I know, <laughs> as shocking as that may seem. Um, so we decided to sell and we literally called up one of our competitors and I said, hey man, um, you wanna buy my company? And they thought I was joking. Because they're like, we've bid against you on all these stupid jobs all the time and you're just gonna give us the company? So well, for the exchange for some dollars, but yeah. And so we, we uh, ended up selling the company and the only thing I asked was two things. You keep all of my staff. We just had this tremendously great staff, just some amazing stories that we were able to help people that were down on their luck and, and, and we, we were able to bring them on and get them well paid and get, them, get their families fed and get them their first car that they had ever owned, right? That's great. It's cool stories like that that are just the best part of entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, yeah, so they, we, they kept all of our employees and we had a bias towards environmentally friendly cleaning practices, right? Chemicals and what have you. Uh, where possible, we want to use stuff that's a little bit more friendly. It's funny thing about environmentally friendly cleaning products. Not only is it good for the planet, it's also good for you because you huffing and puffing bleach all day long. No not, not always that great. So, um, and they were able to do both of those things. We made a tidy profit. Uh, we sold it after, gosh, just a few years, th three years. Um, and so we sold it for a couple million bucks, and uh, there you go, man. The rest is history. <laughs> so it wasn't a two hundred fifty thousand dollar car show. It was a couple million dollar car show. It was a couple million dollar so, car show. Uh, so the accidental entrepreneur. Uh, I didn't know that about you. Uh, I am also an accidental entrepreneur, and I think that some of, some of those stories are some of the most appealing for people who are listening to this show because they're like, how to. Okay, so I'm an accidental entrepreneur. I lost my job. I got fired, whatever, and now I'm having to do this thing. There's a there's amazing stuff on the backside of those accidents. And I would also say this too: it ruins your vacation. Uh, I know, <laughs> I know that if you if you haven't had at least one vacation ruined because of your business, you're not probably doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> that is the I've, truth. I've had at least one vacation ruined because of uh, because of a business. You know, something goes. I, I'm, Anyway, I'm not going to get into it, but I remember one time I was on, on a, I was out with my son. It was just the two of us, kind of father-son deal, and one of my customers absolutely screwed me six sideways. I mean, it was bad. My team was calling me like, what do we do? How do we do it? I had to leave. I had to leave and go home and handle this. And my son, he was cool. You know, he's like, oh, you know, whatever, Daddy. I love you. It's fine. But, yeah, you're, you're probably not doing it right or you're doing it really wrong. Yeah. <laughs> one of the two things. All right, so you got this cleaning business. Yep. Accidental entrepreneur started this with a two hundred fifty thousand dollar, you know, first year revenue. Sold it for a couple million bucks, and then at some point, cigars. Right, some point you were like, "Hey, I'm looking for this uh, Avo seventy seven. Can't find right. it," and that was sparked the idea for Puro Trader. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so there was some overlap there. So I actually had the cleaning company and Puro Trader at the same time. Now, again, Puro Trader was an accidental entrepreneurship. The long story is, I was looking for this very specific cigar. I was looking for an Avo 77. And why I was looking for this one cigar is because back when I was about 21 years old, I went to my very first cigar dinner in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I went to a steakhouse uh, that is still there. And upstairs, they, we had this private dinner, and it was very expensive. 250 bucks, 300 bucks for the ticket. And when I was 21, 300 bucks, might as well have been 300,000 bucks, right? So it was every dollar I had to be in this room. And Avo himself was there. And he considers himself a jazz pianist first and a cigar maker second. And he makes some incredible cigars, so you can imagine how he plays the ivories. So I remember I'm there wearing my only suit, my only suit I own. And in the room are lobbyists, politicians, business owners, you know, I mean, this was the who's who of Boston, right? And then the little old me all dressed up and senior Avo tickling the ivories, playing music, and I'm eating a cigar, eating a steak, smoking a cigar, excuse me, having the time of my life. And I bought his birthday cigar. He was turning 77 years old. This was for his birthday. And he had come out with the Avo 77 to commemorate his 77th birthday. And it was all the money I had to buy my first box of cigars, real box of cigars. 
And so I said, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna age these. I'm gonna put these in my humidor, and I'm not gonna smoke them. I'm just gonna hold on to them. Well, fast forward uh, more than a, about a decade. Fast forward almost a decade, and I had made a little bit of money, and I built a walk-in humidor in my house. And I had moved from Boston to, to California. And in the unpacking of my collection out of these sort of uh, bigger uh, cabinet style humidors into the you know, walk-in humidor, um, I'm going through everything. And there's that box of Avo 77s. So I, so I grab the box and I open it up. And there's one cigar missing. And I'm like, hmm. I sure as hell didn't smoke it, <laughs> but it grew legs somewhere, uh, somewhere along the line. How many I'm, kids do you have? Yeah, well, they're too young for that, but <laughs> I got a couple of knucklehead buddies that I'm sure didn't oh. know what it was and just grabbed one. And so I did what anybody else would do. I was like, well, I need one. How hard can that be? Yes, it was a limited edition cigar, you know, eight, nine years ago at the time. Um, I'll just go on Google. So I start Googling, nothing. Uh, I go, I call my cigar buddies, nothing. I call a couple cigar shops, nothing. I go on cigar forums, puff.com, Scarfish, not, I got all, all of them. Hey, I'm looking for this cigar. I'll pay you 50 bucks for the stick. I'll pay you a hundred bucks for this. I just want one. Anybody got it? Nothing. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Why isn't there a way where I can look through everybody's humidor Everybody's collection seems pretty obvious, right? Collectors, I don't care if you collect sneakers, stamps, coins, wine, it doesn't matter. You like to geek out with other people that are like-minded, that have that same passion. So what if I just created a platform where you could input your own collection, it's kind of what I call an e-humidor, right? An online humidor, and then just simply make it searchable. So now I can look at it and you can look at mine. That was the business, quote unquote business. I'm using air quotes here because as you can hear, there's no way to monetize that, yeah. right? It wasn't some big expense. So I hired a buddy of mine that's a coder and eventually we figured out how to, how to build this thing and we did. And it took off. And ultimately what ended up happening was, well, you're in Portland, Maine and I'm in Los Angeles and you got something that I like. Well, how do we do this? I don't know you, you don't know me, but I want to buy that thing that you got commerce commences. So we had this kind of, uh, you know, get off the pot moment and said, okay, let's figure out how we can monetize this by creating a safe and secure way to have a secondary market, effectively a stock market for cigars. Hmm. And that's how it started. And that was in 2015, 16, somewhere around there? So we started building in 20, uh, the end of 2014 into 2015. It took us well over a year to build it. Again, we had no sense of urgency. It's not a business, right? We didn't start to monetize until coming into 2017, right? Um, and then it started slow, sort of real slow. Uh, the first year we had just a handful of sales a month, two or three sales a month, very lightly used. And the reason was that we had a lot of demand, but very, very little inventory, right? And so collectors by definition, collect. They're not called sellers, they're called collectors. So we had a whole bunch of people who were looking to buy, not enough people who were looking to sell. So what we learned from that is, wow, maybe if we reached out to some retailers throughout the country and have them put their inventory on there also. So now we've got regular Joe Blows putting their collection up there as well as some retailers. Now, We'll have enough people on there that are both buying and selling. And that started to produce some more sales, but still wasn't the trick. What we realized the trick was is we had to step up and put a guarantee on everybody's purchase. Because as many people know, I'm sure your viewers know, cigars have to be kept right. right? The right temperature and the right humidity specifically. And if they're not, they're ruined. The value's ruined, the smoking experience is ruined. It's over. So many users thought, well, how do I know they've been kept in good condition? Right? They're, the question was always, I don't know that guy. I don't know how he keeps his cigars. I don't they're, want they're in his sock drawer. What's wrong with that, right? Well, exactly. <laughs> and, and I would push back on people saying, yeah, but do you use Uber? 
Yes. Okay. How do you know he keeps his car in good condition? How do you know he, you know, he's not going to get a blowout or he, he's replaced the brake pads? You don't know. The only way that you get in that car is because you believe that it's because it's his car, he probably treats it kind of similar to the way you treat your car, right? And he doesn't want to die and get into an accident, and neither do you. So kind of copacetic. Same thing for cigar guys. If you go and spend $500 or $1,000 on a box of cigar, you're not going to throw them in your sock drawer, right? You're probably going to take care of them. Right. So it sounds obvious, but it was actually a lot of training of our customers to get them over the hump of trusting that other people took care of their cigars just as well as they did. And you put a guarantee in place, right? Yeah. So that's what we had to do. Ultimately, we had to put, you know. How'd that work? So what we said is we guarantee that the transaction will go smoothly. What that means is you either get what you paid for or you get your money back every dime. That's it. Yeah. And And then if somebody's selling bad stuff, you can go say, hey, you don't get to sell anymore. Correct. We kick them off. That's right. And we have a, we, we have a very strict zero tolerance policy. We don't allow, like if you make a mistake and you get kicked off, that's it. There's no strikes. There's no warnings. There's no nothing. You, you either play to the highest degree of ethical standards or you are out. Um, not a great way to make friends sometimes, um, but nonetheless, it's what we have to do to maintain the platform. And so it's really funny how that all sort of transpired. So fast forward to today, where are we? Uh, so the most collectible cigars in the world are Cuban cigars. Well, we're an American-based company. We can't deal in Cubans. Uh, not Did the, the, the embargo, not the, the, the remover, removal of the embargo not affect that at all? Uh, so we didn't remove the embargo. Oh, it didn't? No. I guess I misunderstood. We, yeah, we, re- we loosened up to the restrictions, but we never removed the embargo. Oh, okay. And uh, we can talk all about that if you want. But long story short, um, we never fully removed it, which is why here in the United States you still can't get them. Uh-huh. Um, while it's easier now to have them because now the law states that if you or I travel overseas, we can now legally buy them overseas and bring them back in the United States for either personal consumption or to gift, you still can't sell and you're still limited on how many you can bring. Okay. So outside of Cuban cigars, there's a bunch of other brands that people are very familiar with that are very collectible as well. So we are the number one platform in the world as a secondary market or as a peer-to-peer platform. We're the largest. So if you're looking for rare and vintage cigars, um, aged cigars, limited production stuff, crazy stuff, uh, we are the default place uh, in the United States. And so how many people are on the platform now? How many How many users? You, it's uh, the largest one, right? Yeah, so a quarter million users, 300,000 users, somewhere in that range. That is amazing. And yeah. so that was... So that goes back to 14, 15, and yep. you start monetizing in 17. You know, we're in 2021 right now, so it's been three or four or five years since you've done that. Obviously, it's going well because now you're in, you got a VC company, you've also got uh, a wine business that you're dealing with. So it sounds to me, if I could make some assumptions here and you fill in the blanks, it sounds to me like that really Puro Traders was the thing, besides the cleaning company, the Puro Traders has really been that dot that that launching pad for the other ventures that you're doing is that is that a correct assumption yeah i got hooked man it's like a drug entrepreneurship is like a drug because there's the excitement of figuring it out i believe that entrepreneurship is the most creative endeavor that someone can do it's the most rewarding it is it's like figuring out a puzzle and you're but it's competitive right? Because not only are you competing with yourself, but you're competing with the market. And you're trying to unlock this kind of code to get your business to be successful. So in that way, it's super challenging. It's really exciting. It's super hard, right? And typically the things that are the most rewarding are the most difficult. And so Puro Trader really got me to think differently about entrepreneurship and what I was able to build and also how I wanted to live my life and what mattered to me as a, as a father, as a, as a, uh, a husband, as a, as a man. Um, so it really sort of reframing how I wanted my life to look, right? So here's a good example. You said, Hey, Pierre, come out for the show. I said, okay, I'll hop on a plane. Now, if I had some corporate, you know, insurance actuary job in a cubicle, well, that's what I would be doing. Yeah. Right. But I said, Oh, tell the wife, tell my staff, Hey, I'm out. I'm gonna go see Jason. We're gonna go grab a cigar. <laughs> Uh, and I took off, right? That's awesome. Um, I'll work for my hotel a little bit tomorrow. 
see you tomorrow night fly home Friday, have dinner in LA with the wife, and it, it'll be wonderful. Um, but entrepreneurship allows this uh, expansion and contraction of work, this sense of reward and fulfillment, the way that working for a big company never gave me personally. That, well, listen, I, and that's why I do what I do. I, I truly believe what you just said with everything that is within me, that entrepreneurship is not only the most exciting and fulfilling thing that you can do, but I also believe that it is entrepreneurs who change the world. Yes. Like the 250,000 users you've got on that platform right now, you know, some, a lot of people listening don't care anything about cigars, and that's fine. You don't have to. But those two, that quarter of a million people, their lives are enriched because of some idea that you had. And think about, I think you told an interesting story pre-show about Reebok, and you, you had the founder of Reebok on your show. And he was talking about how that happened and he just wanted to make shoes. He's a shoe cobbler for goodness sake, mm -hmm. but look at how many people have done world record triathlons and run and meets and have done rock climbing because of the idea that that guy had to start shoes. And then now you're doing it in the VC world through venture capital to invest in pieces of other companies that help prop up entrepreneurship, man, we're, we're connected on this. And I, and I really do think that the listeners, kind of buy into that too, because they're entrepreneurs or want entrepreneurs. They want to build something, they want to do something, which is why I do the show about success. Like what's the root of that? So let me ask you this question, which I ask every single entrepreneur on this show. What is your definition of success? Like, how do you define it? Man, that is such a difficult and nuanced question. So I have a long winded answer, but I'll give the short version. I ultimately want to be able to make a huge impact on the world and specifically people, right? I want to impact people in a very, very positive way. I have found that that generates the most amount of reward for me, the thing I enjoy the most. And if I do that and I do it really well, then the financial freedom comes with it. So what I try to do is I try to give as much as possible with no expectation of reward, right? So for instance, um, I help a lot of people who will ping me and go, hey man, I, I need help with my startup. Uh, can you mentor me for my startup? Or can you introduce me to angel investors or VCs? Uh, can you help me with my pitch or my pitch deck? How do I get into this marketplace? Who do you know that you might be able to introduce? So I'm always trying to help, 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 help. And the more that I do that, the better I feel. Right? It, it's kind of a weird thing. I don't do it to be selfish, but man, does it feel so good when you're able to really help folks. And so with that in mind, do you consider yourself to be successful? Those, I never feel successful, just to be clear. Um, so this is probably the darker side of my personality. If you put a billion dollars in my bank account, I wouldn't change my life really at all. And I talk about this all the time. Um, I, what I enjoy doing is helping folks. We all need money and don't get me wrong, we talked about my cars and other things like that. I like nice stuff, I get it. But at the end of the day, having the financial freedom to be able to take care of my family, as well as being able to impact as many people as possible, um, really means a lot to me. That's kind of what kind of charges me up. And, and not to get woo woo or spiritual on anybody, but. Uh, I don't know if you believe in God or if you believe in sort of the universe or whatever you believe in. The world has so much out there, right? So many sights to see, so many interesting people, arts, food, culture, traditions, all these amazing things. And yet I see so many Americans in particular who, who they get a nine to five job, they never leave their town. Maybe they take one vacation a year. They live a very small and simple life. And, and if that makes them happy, then, then all for it. But if you happen to believe in God and he made all of these things, you not experiencing those things, not trying all of those experiences that the universe, that God, whatever has given, seems kind of insulting. So let me put it maybe more of a microcosm. Let's pretend I'm a famous artist, a painter, a singer, whatever. And you and I are lifelong friends. We've been friends for 30 years. And you've never seen a single one of my paintings? Wouldn't that be kind of insulting? <laughs> That's a good point. Right? A good at point. some point, you'd be like, are we actually friends? Like, you 
don't really seem to be engaged with what I'm up to. I right? love that. So I kind of have this weird thing where I, I, I want to, my version of success is, is being able to help people experiencing as much as life can, can give me. I want as many experiences as possible. Because at the end of the day, we all die naked, curled up by ourselves. And the only thing that we're taking with us is our memories and our experiences. We're not taking our money. We're not taking any, anything else. It's that. Yep. And so the richer I have become with experiences, it's kind of a funny thing that happens. My wallet gets bigger too. That's kind of interesting. When I tried to focus on the wallet, not only did I not get the experiences, I didn't make as much money. It's a weird thing, right? Yeah, I love that perspective here. I, I, I've never heard anybody say it the, the way that you said it, but I think the sentiment is that, is that God created us to enjoy this place. And I, I, I do, I follow Jesus and I'm very much uh, in tune with what you're talking about. And I think that in the beginning, if you look at the story in Genesis of creation, when God created the heavens and the earth and he put Adam and Eve in the garden, it was the most beautiful, perfect thing ever. And what was their purpose? Just enjoy it. That was the original intent. God's like, enjoy it guys. You don't have to plant anything. You don't have to grow anything. You don't have to throw, you know, like it was all there for their enjoyment. Now they screwed up and they wanted to be like God. And I don't want to get too spiritual in this, but I am a follower of Jesus and I make no bones about that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but I do believe that God had created us to enjoy it and sins kind of screwed that up. But that doesn't mean his original intent is not there for us. Yes. Go enjoy it. <laughs> Have fun. Now that, that, now the way you enjoy it, it's different than the way I want to enjoy it. That's completely cool. But man, go to Hawaii, go to Australia, go to Canada, go yes. to all these amazingly beautiful locations, enjoy what God's done. And then the only thing that moves from this life to the next, you were talking about you can't take money with you. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And I always wondered, well, what, how do you do that? Like, do I send a check? How do I, how does, <laughs> do I have Bitcoin? Is that, yeah. what, what is that? So here's what it is. The only thing that moves from this life to the next are people. That is it. That's the only thing. And so if I want to invest and, and put my just put my treasures in heaven, it's people. So I love what you said. I love investing in people because that's one of my number one things. I invest in people, businesses, and ideas. And people is number one. And that's why I run an apprenticeship program. I mentor, mentor young guys in, in entrepreneurship. And I love, love what you're saying. And I hope that listeners love it too because that's what you and, you and I are all about the same thing, man. I love that. So success, you define success as making an impact. Talked about it in terms of people. You humbly said that you don't consider yourself successful in, in, his, in, in the terms of the worldly success. But I think everybody would look at you and say, yeah, he's successful. Because success is about achieving the desired results. The, the, the keys to success that I lay out for everybody are five things. The first is passion. And we've already talked about the second two, place and people. So I'm going to go back to passion. So passion Cigars is a passion for you. I could tell it. I know from meeting you and talking to you, hearing that story about that Avo 77 that you met that guy, Avo, in, you know, when he was 77. And, and, and you were a young 20-something who spent a lot of money on a box of cigars. That's a passion. That is an indicator of success, but it does not guarantee success. But the real passion, the word means, the etymology of the word means to be willing to suffer or endure, which is why the passion of the Christ is called the passion of the Christ. It wasn't that he was excited about it. <laughs> it was that he had a, had, a, had a willingness to endure for a larger cause. So passion and all the entrepreneurs I've studied, and just like you, there was this willingness to push through the hard times, a willingness to endure because there was a greater goal on the backside. How did passion, that side of passion, play into your success? That's everything. I mean, without passion, don't bother. I don't even listen. I, I'm a little bit uh, cavalier when it comes to this subject, but if you don't have passion around things, a lot of things, I have too many passions, right? For folks that are sitting at home and go, well, I don't really know what my passion is, I feel for you. That probably means you haven't experienced enough stuff. So if you're a person that sits back and goes, man, I'm not really passionate about anything, that means you got to get out of your apartment, leave your house and go do stuff, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, it's experience as much of life as you possibly can. And through doing that, you will find what you like and what you don't like. Everyone has passion in them. They might have just covered it up, not experienced it yet, but you have to. So being an entrepreneur is easily the most difficult, the most stressful, hardest thing I have ever done by far. 
and I wouldn't trade it for anything. But the only thing that you can eat is passion because it is so hard that any sensible, intelligent human being would absolutely not be an entrepreneur and they would definitely give up. And so I call it being reasonable. You want to be a successful entrepreneur? You need to be unreasonable. So let me ask you a question. Do you think Elon Musk is reasonable? He's putting rockets on the moon. He, he went into the auto industry, completely changed that. Love or hate the guy doesn't matter. Would you think that Elon Musk is a reasonable person? Or Jeff Bezos, does that seem like a normal, reasonable kind of guy? No, not, not even a little bit, right? They are so forward future, future thinking and take these massive long-term bets that those are unreasonable things to do. No reasonable human being would say, I got a great idea. I'm going to take on auto manufacturing and NASA at the same time. That's what I'm going to do and be successful at. A reasonable person would say, I'm going to go be an accountant. <laughs> That's great. That's a good point, man. That is really good. I had not thought about it in terms of reasonability and unreasonability because I consider myself a reasonable person and I think that the world needs more reasonable people. But I see your point. It's like you've got to think through what's normal, what what is acceptable and say, look, I don't, I don't settle for... I don't settle, period. Yes. I don't settle, period, in the sentence. I'm going to push. And that's what entrepreneurs like Bezos and like Musk and like Rogers, like mm -hmm. you have done, and like so many others before you and me and who will come as a result of listing podcasts like this, that we can push through those things. Passion will carry us. And then the second P is being in the right place at the right time. We've already talked about that. Third P is knowing the right people. We talked about that in your story. But the fourth P is preparation. How did you prepare? What know-how did you have to be successful in the cigar business? Well, you know what? Let's back up because I think that probably a listener is going to go, wait a minute, Jason, you always talk about this preparation. You got to have know-how. And Pierre just sat here and told a story that he sold a cleaning company for $3 million that he knew Jack about. But that doesn't mean you weren't prepared, right? Tell us, tell us about how you got prepared for that. So I tell people all the time, I am I'm not the smartest guy. I didn't go to the Ivy League school. I grew up single parent, you know, no dad. My mom was an alcoholic. I did not have any of those advantages. So because I didn't have any of those advantages, I could only control what I could control, which is really my work ethic. That's about it. That's all I can really control. And prep, well, that's work ethic, right? Putting the, the laps in, right? Doing the, doing the repetitions. So in my finance job, my job was to sell really smart finance people on sophisticated financial products. So my clients were CFOs, analysts, and financial advisors for companies like Merrill Lynch, Boeing, Google, CalPERS, uh, et cetera, right? big, big companies. That was my job. So in order to have that job, you have to be super prepared which means you've got to read all the research and understand it, which never ends, right? You're just constantly reading what's happening in the market, what people's thoughts are on it, as well as your own internal th thoughts on it. Um, then you've got to be personable. You have to go and put yourself in uncomfortable situations to go meet these people and get them to uh, invest their clients' money into your products. Um, not an easy thing to do. And so again, by not being the smartest person, I always had a chip on my shoulder. So I said, well, you can't out-prepare me. So I would read books on how to carry myself. I would have mentors that I would look to, to how do I act, how do I dress, how do I speak? Um, what what uh, research reports, we call them white papers, what white papers do I need to read? And if the average guy is reading three, I'm reading six. If the average guy's reading six, I'm reading 12, right? Whatever the standard was, I had to do significantly more than that. It didn't matter whatever the standard was. And so that is the prep. So then when this business came around, well, I was already pretty savvy in terms of the market, right? Finance and how uh, businesses made money. That's what we did. We invested in publicly traded companies. Um, I was also very well versed in presenting and talking to people, yeah. right? and building trust and rapport, I could quickly and easily walk into a room full of strangers and be joking and laughing as if we've been longtime friends. That took practice. I wasn't born that way, yeah. quite the opposite, right? That took deliberate, 
focused practice. And so I would set little games for myself, right? So I would walk into a, into a Merrill Lynch office where I didn't know anybody. And these guys are the biggest financial advisors looking after hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars. And they don't want to talk to me. They've got a business to run. I would have to figure out how to get in there and make them like me so they would take the next meeting and the next meeting and eventually they would look at what our products were and hopefully buy it, right? And the process of doing that is the prep. So I would set little games like, okay, you know it's gonna be uncomfortable and I really don't wanna kind of do this. I won't leave until I get five business cards or I won't leave until I get three business cards or I won't leave until I set an appointment with Sue or set an appointment with Steve, right? I would make these little games with, my, with myself because I don't wanna do it. Right? I'd rather go home and watch Netflix, but I want to be successful. So I'd have to play these little tricks on myself. That's great. Uh, and so I would do that over and over. So then when the cleaning company started, I met this guy. We had great rapport instantly. I knew about the market. I could speak confidently. And so for him, he, from his perspective, he thought, well, Pierre's an expert. He's been doing this for forever. He doesn't know that the company's four days old, five days old. <laughs> right? Um, that's the prep. I love that. I, you know, I, I say this a lot, you know, fake it till you make it. It's kind of been my mantra. When I started my, the, the company, my biggest, most successful company so far, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing, but I faked it till I made it. Now I didn't lie. I didn't do anything without integrity, but you got to, I was prepared for those moments because of all the things that came before and every successful entrepreneur, just like you, just like me, just like Musk and Bezos, they all had preparation. They had know how to get there. It was passion. It was right place, right time, knowing the right people, preparation. And then the fifth piece plan. Yep. And you didn't have a written business plan for the cleaning company because it was five years, five days old when you met your first customer. Um, you didn't, it doesn't seem to me like you had a written business plan for, for Puro Traders, but that's not, not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your plan is your ability to obtain and deploy the financial resources to be successful because it takes money. It absolutely takes money. So what was your plan with how to be the success? Well, let's use your VC company. We haven't talked about that at all. Like that takes money. That takes capital. Yep. So how do you, what's your plan? Like how do you obtain and deploy the financial resources to do what you're doing in the venture capital world? So I've been fortunate enough to be successful in my life in order to acquire currency so that I can turn around and deploy that capital to make more capital and impact the world. And venture capital is one way that you can do that. And the definition of a venture capitalist or an angel investor, because they're very similar, uh, is that they take capital and they invest in small businesses with the hope that they are going to really grow, that that capital is going to be sort of the fertilizer for, for them to grow. And uh, I really like this idea of being able to not only make money, but also impact the world, right? Change the world. That's a big, big thing for me. And so venture capital was a way that I could do that. Now, what I really like doing is building companies. I really, really enjoy that. And so I was a venture capitalist for many years, and I enjoyed the process of meeting founders, uh, super smart, sophisticated, interesting people that were um, you know, risk takers and cowboys that wanted to change the world and just saw the world differently. That's a very intoxicating, exciting environment to be around. And I just wanted to do it all day, every day, right? It was just so cool to be able to invest in a company and watch it bloom, right, change. And I developed my own thesis on what I liked in a founder or founding team and why I invested in them. And uh, so part of it was my own money, part of it was what we call LP capital, right? Limited partnerships. So people would give me money uh, to invest in startups on their behalf. It was my job to go sort of find them, vet them, do the due diligence and figure out which ones we wanted to invest in uh, or not. And I would put my capital in those businesses as well. And so what makes my venture investing a little bit different is that I invest in a deal. If you would, you Mr. or Mrs. Investor, if you'd like to come in on the deal, you may. I have sort of X amount of dollars I can put in. I'm putting my money in first. That's whether you come in or not, doesn't matter, I'm in. That's very different than how traditional venture capital is done. Um, so I enjoy doing that a lot, um, but what I really enjoyed doing is being a founder. 
and really building something. And so back in August of 2019, we started my wine company, uh, really to wildly impact and, and radically change the wine industry forever. Uh, we thought that the wine industry was pretty broken, actually, and I can kind of prove it. Uh, so when you think about wine, and you go to go buy wine in your town, whatever town you're in, Portland, Maine, Los Angeles, Nashville, Tennessee, doesn't matter, you will find that whether you go to Costco or Whole Foods or your local mom and pop wine shop, all the wine kind of looks the same. It's all the same names, right? It's all the same big brands. You see them in every single store, no matter where you are in the United States. Then you go to a restaurant, and I don't mean just fancy restaurants. I mean just a you know, above average restaurant that might have a wine list and you look at that wine list and go, man, I don't know most of the names on this wine list. Well, how is that? So I get this wine list, I'm looking at it, and I go, man, I don't know 80% of the names on this wine list. Then I leave the restaurant and I go back out into town. I can't find any of that wine anywhere. That seems weird. That's a kind of a being observant. What the heck is that about? So come to find out, we have this thing in the United States called the three-tier system. So if you're a vineyard, if you produce wine in the United States, you have three ways that you can sell wine traditionally. You can either do it at the vineyard, right? People come to your vineyard, they do a tasting, maybe they buy a case, maybe they become part of your wine club. Okay, that's one way, we call that on-premise. Uh, two is at the restaurant. You, you as the wine producer, you, you call up restaurants and convince them to carry your wine. Or you can hire a broker and he'll uh, sell your wine into restaurants. A little less margin that way, but theoretically more volume. Okay, uh, And then the last way is what's called the three-tier system, which is where you, the producer, the vineyard, convince a wholesaler to buy your wine. And then the wholesaler moves it on to a distributor, and the distributor moves it to a retailer, like a Whole Foods or a Costco, and then you buy it. Well, the problem with that system is it's super crazy competitive. The margins are razor thin, typically a couple of points, meaning you, the vineyard, is making one, two, three percent. That's it. And the volume requirements, the amount of wine you have to produce is so incredibly high that most vineyards just can't do it. So to kind of put a number to it, you as an American only have access to about 11% of the wine made in your own country. Forget foreign wines. If we include foreign wines in terms of what you have access to, meaning you go online or you go to a store and find it, uh, if you include international vineyards, it drops to 99% that you do not have access to. You just can't go get it. Well, I thought that's categorically stupid. That doesn't make any sense at all. Why don't we just create a single platform where we can plug into all of the different vineyards throughout the United States. That way you, the customer, can go online and always find whatever bottle of wine that is whether it's a big, huge brand like a Mondavi or whether it's some small, obscure brand that only makes 50 cases a year, well, let's just let the market sort it out. Let's just make a, a sort of agnostic platform to it all so everybody can come there. And what's this platform called? So it's called Yayin, Y-A-H-Y-N, Yayin. Yayin is actually the ancient Greek Hebrew word for wine. Uh, it's actually believed to be the very first word for wine Ever. Really? So we want to pay homage, if you will, uh, to all the great winemakers, the people with dirt on their boots, right, that pick the grapes and harvest and crush and ferment. We think that is beautiful and romantic and we want to celebrate that. We just don't like what happens after they put it in the bottle, right, the distribution side. Well, then there's another problem that we come across. Okay, so we, we come up with this idea and we think we're all smart and right, we build this thing out and then we realize, well, man, if I bring somebody and show them a website with 20,000 different bottles of wine, that's not very helpful because they don't know what to get. Yeah. They're confused. We call that the paradox of choice. Too many choices. Too many choices. Then people won't make any choice. Then they make no choice. That's exactly correct. So what we did is we, using artificial intelligence, we taught a computer how to taste wine and we can give you an exact match on our site with what wine is going to be bespoke to you, what's going to be recommended to you, you the individual. Um, and this is radically different than how wine is sold today, right? Again, if you go online or go into a, a brick and mortar store, wine is sold to you based on a rating, right? Oh, this one's 92 points, this one's 95 points. Well, 
that's what somebody else thinks about the wine. That's not what I think about the wine. That's what some guy who theoretically knows way more about wine than I do, that's what he thinks. But he's not me. He likes sardines. I hate sardines. Why would I listen to this guy? <laughs> so I always thought that that was really broken. And I wanted a way that I, I'm the one buying it. I'm the one drinking it. How do I, I know what, what's good? So we use artificial intelligence to actually pair you. We call it our Y score. And we'll ask you a handful of non-wine related questions. Again, you don't have to know anything about wine at all. Uh, and you can come onto the site answer a couple of questions and we will pair you with the highest percent match to your bespoke palate, to you specifically. Because, How do they do that? Where do they go to do that? Uh, you can go to yayin.com, Y-A-H-Y-N.com uh, and go on there and we've got 10,000 different bottles of wine on there and you can check out the artificial intelligence. It's all for free. Um, we don't charge for any of that service. And then we did one more thing because we're talking about impacting people, right? And, I, and it's really my goal to impact people. Well, artificial intelligence is great. Working with a computer is great. Some people really like what we call a digital interface, right? There are some people who would rather stand in line at the bank to go to the ATM machine than have to talk to the bank teller, right? That's some people's personality. Now, there's some folks who go, I don't like the ATM. I don't trust that thing. I want to talk to the teller. Right? So people, some people prefer a human interface. So what we did is well, COVID happened. While we're building this company, COVID happened. I'm going to talk about timing. And we thought, well, all these restaurants are getting murdered. Right? They are just, all these restaurants throughout the United States are getting shut down, especially the ones that have sommeliers, right? the higher-end restaurants that, that have a sommelier on staff. So one thing that kind of goes uncovered in the media is COVID-19 made every sommelier in the United States unemployed because every high-end restaurant that had a sommelier, they closed, right? If you think about the restaurants that were successful through COVID, it was people doing takeout. They weren't buying bottles of wine from a sommelier. <laughs> Not on the sidewalk of the drive through right? Not exactly. <laughs> so we went out and we hired those sommeliers and they actually manage our chat service. That's really cool, man. So like a lot of websites, we have a chat service, right? And most people hate the chat service because it's either a bot, right? It's either some sort of computer program. Or some or, college kids. Or <laughs> some random dude in another country that doesn't know anything uh -huh. and it ends up being a waste. So we said, you know what? What if we can positively impact the wine community that we love and hire these displaced, out-of-work sommeliers to manage our chat service so that you, the customer, if you don't want to do the computer thing, and go through the AI, you just go, hey, I'm having bolognese tonight with the wife. What do I get? This is what I like. And you can chat right from your iPhone in real time with a real sommelier. Again, we don't charge anything for it. We just do it to provide as much value as possible. I love that, man. Yeah. So not to turn this into a commercial, but it was all of the things that I had built before. Some of them were on purpose. Some of them were not on purpose. Um, all the mistakes that I had made before. All of that turned into preparation. That was my prep to build this. And now I've been able to build this amazing company. We're doing incredible things. And I get to build it my way, right? I, so I, we, we focus a lot on culture. We focus a lot on the customer. Some things that I That's am great. passionate about. But it was all that preparedness of doing it wrong, of making mistakes, of stumbling around that got me to the point where we are now. And now... We took on venture capital dollars and we've got some really amazing board members and we've been in the press and doing all these crazy things and it all looks all wonderful and fancy and people say, oh, Pierre, you're so lucky. I go, lucky? I got kicked in the teeth uh, for like 15 years. The harder you work, the luckier you get, man. Don't ever forget that. The harder you work, the luckier you get. So you're like, so this, so this eclectic, you know, Fortune 500, you know, big corporate job, you know, starting an accidental entrepreneur cleaning business, got into the cigar business because it wasn't meeting a, a need that you had, got into the wine business for the same reason, got into the VC business. And I, I, I know that listening to this show right now, there's a there's an entrepreneur sitting in his car, uh, somebody walking their dog on the sidewalk, somebody on the treadmill listening to this, and they are a, a, an entrepreneur early stage or they haven't started yet. What would you tell them? Give me Give me one minute. One minute of advice, what you'd tell them. So what I have learned more than anything 
is that it is a war of attrition, which means you have to keep going and going far beyond what a reasonable person would do. And that goes to passion, right? I mean, you got to be willing to endure through the crap. Yes. I will tell people right now, a rational person would look at the journey and go, it is not worth it. Because the, the likelihood you're going to get kicked in the teeth is real high. You're going to eat dirt. Yes. But if you eat the dirt, if you go through those hard times, the person that you become on the other side, what you are then capable of doing is a thousand percent worth it. So you have to, ha you have, frankly, I say come to Jesus, right? You got to come to Jesus with this idea of like, hey, who I am today is not who I'm going to be tomorrow. And the only way to go through that is to go through really hard times. Yeah. So let's, let's turn, turn it away from entrepreneurship for a second and look at athletics, right? You want to be Tom Brady? How many push-ups do you think Tom Brady has done? How many routes has he run? How many practices has he gone to? He hasn't done 10,000 hours. He's done a million hours, right? Oh, you want to be a Navy SEAL? Do you think you become a Navy SEAL by watching Netflix and hanging out? No, you do it by eating dirt, going through this incredibly difficult level of training, right? And you find that with top performers in any industry, whether you're an author, a race car driver, a Navy SEAL, an entrepreneur, it does not matter. The universe, God, whatever, there is a process. And part of that process is eating dirt, man. And if you can do it, it's worth it. All right. Well, you heard it, guys. That's uh, this is the way to success. Like what you're talking about is you got to push through. You got to be passionate. How would people get in touch with you? Let's finish up our conversation with just telling people they love your story. Love your story. You do have the podcast. There is no try, so they can go find that on podcast players. How else do they get in touch with you? Uh, most people go to PierreRogers.com. Uh, on PierreRogers.com, there's you can find me there. Right, either various speaking events, uh, events that I do. The podcast is on there. Uh, most of it is just articles that I've written about um, success and entrepreneurship and things of that nature. Uh, that's where most people go or your Instagram uh, at Piero Rogers. All right. Well, his name is Pierre Rogers. So you can go to PierreRogers.com and his Instagram is Puro Rogers, P-U-R-O. So don't get that mixed up because it sounded kind of the same, but I know it's different. <laughs> so PierreRogers.com or Puro Rogers on Instagram. Well, there you have it, folks. Just like every time we talk to another successful entrepreneur like Pierre, you learn that these five keys unlock success for everybody. It's, it's the same thing. The key unlocks the door. And I, and I love that you're listening to this show, and I love that you're watching this on YouTube, and I love that you're interested in success because it is yours to be had. You can be successful. You just have to use the right keys of passion, being in the right place at the right time, knowing the right people, being prepared, having that plan. And as Pierre put it so eloquently, eat the dirt. <laughs> you got to eat the dirt. Well, if you are asking yourself, how do I know that I'm going to be successful? Well, I've got an assessment that's completely free on my website at therealjasonduncan.com slash success. Go to therealjasonduncan.com dot com slash success and there's a 17 question assessment doesn't take long to do you immediately get a personalized report with your odds your chances your probability of success in the venture that you are thinking about doing and it's completely free my service to you another thing that i do is my vision is i want to see a thousand entrepreneurs start a thousand businesses a year because like what pierre and our pierre and i talked about is that i truly believe that entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to change the world they make the world a better place and so to that end what i do is I provide coaching and I provide mentorship, et cetera. And of course I, I do that and you pay me for that. And that's, I'm expensive. That's fine. But also I do a free one hour session with some entrepreneur somewhere in the world every single week. And that could be you. So if you say, Hey, I'm not ready to sign up for your coaching. I don't you know, I don't need that. I just need one hour to work through a real issue. Just reach out to me. I'm the real Jason Duncan. I help real entrepreneurs deal with real issues. You go to my website, the real Jason Duncan.com slash free coaching slash free coaching and you fill out that form it's just name address and what do you need help with my team and i will take a look at your answers and if your answer meets what we're looking for you might be that lucky guest on my free one hour coaching session every week to help real entrepreneurs like you deal with real issues i'm the real jason duncan this is the root of all success podcast i will see you next week when we interview another very successful entrepreneur about his or her road to success until then remember jesus is king 
Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.